So that was my short introduction and let us now go to the first technical presentation. And that is a presentation given by Rhonda Reiter. Uh, well, Rhonda got her PhD, well, a while ago from the University of California at Berkeley, 1986, where she's now a professor at the Industrial Engineering and OR Department, where she holds the Ronald W. Wolf Chancellor's Chair. She wrote many papers on stochastic modeling and optimization at large, with applications to service manufacturing, telecommunications, and large-scale computing systems. Recently, she worked on new classes of models for which, well, there is a product form and insensitivity. And actually, that's also the topic that she is going to be talking about today. So please, Rhonda, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you, uh, Michelle and Nikki and Peter, for organizing this uh, conference. Uh, let me share my screen. So today I'm gonna to talk about robustness in Markov matching models. And this is joint work with my student, Runhan Shi, and um, also my uh, good buddy, Christy Gardner. And, um, oops. and I had to throw in this relation to queuing, of course, but uh, apropos of uh, the very long mother of all queues this weekend, just to pay respects to Queen Elizabeth, I came across this tweet. Uh, Q is a beautiful word, the actual important letter, and then four more silently waiting behind it in a line. This is the audience to appreciate that. Okay, so <clears throat> robustness in Markov matching models. Well, so what do we mean by Markov matching model? And what do we mean by robustness? So I'm going to start defining these terms. So a matching model uh, for us just has um, uh, a bipartite matching structure and you have uh, Poisson arrivals on the two sides, the A side and the B side, each with their own rates and independent uh, Poisson processes. And so we could have on the A side, it could be jobs or drivers or buyers or patients or customers. And then on the B side, co correspondingly, services, riders, sellers, organs, products. And it's completely symmetric. So uh, we can think of either uh, groups on either side. Uh, so that's just the matching part. Now, to, um, but now we need the cues. And so a one-sided matching model has a Q on one side. So in this picture, the Q is on the A side and uh, we here uh, have the items that are waiting to be matched. And on the one-sided matching model, there's no Q on the B side. So B side arrivals are either immediately matched to a compatible item or they're lost. And again, it's symmetric. So we could have a one-sided matching model where we're, um, Q is on the, the B side and A side arrivals are lost if they don't find a compatible uh, match from the B side. And these models, um, we can include exponential abandonments and or finite buffers um, on a side and the buffers, we could have a common buffer for the whole side or we could have separate buffers for each class. So that's the general setup for a one-sided model. We'll also talk about two-sided models where we have cues on both sides and uh, an arrival on either side looks to see is there a match on the other side and in which case they both leave. If it doesn't find a match, it goes into the queue. So this could be say a make to stock, make to order production system, or one where uh, we, the patients arrive on one side and the organs can stick around maybe for a little while at least on the, the B side while we figure out a match. Um, now here the state space is restricted because we, by definition, once you find a match, you leave. So any, uh, items queued on the A side must be incompatible with all the items on the B side and vice versa. So this is also known as independent sets in the literature. And once we have uh, two sides, we need to add extra conditions for stability. And this is all I'm gonna say about stability. Even if it's one-sided, there are conditions for stability. They're fairly um, 
obvious uh, conditions. And for our uh, results, sometimes we'll be interested in the transient case, so we won't be concerned with stability. Uh, sometimes we'll be looking at the uh, stationary distribution, in which case we will assume it's stable. If it's two-sided, uh, for sure, we need at least uh, one side to have either abandonments or uh, finite buffer. Okay, and <laughs> what this model is not, another uh, kind of two-sided matching model um, that has appeared in the literature is where the items arrive in pairs, one from each side, an A side and B side together. And that is not this model for us, they're independent um, processes. Okay, so let me just pause here to make sure we're all on the same page on the basic set. Then what do we mean by robustness? And robustness means all sorts of things in the literature for us. The first one is policy space collapse. That means that service discipline doesn't matter. So the system is robust to uh, service discipline. And I'm gonna say a little bit more about that in the next slide. And the other um, form of robustness we will see is insensitivity where service time distributions don't matter. And this is in the classic queuing uh, meaning of insensitivity. So that means that for um, in the stationary uh, case, the stationary distribution, the mean is the same if you replace all the exponential distributions by arbitrary distributions, but uh, the same mean. Um, <clears throat> and also another kind of form of robustness, it turns out for the, the models where we see this sort of policy space collapse in particular, uh, are the cases where we have robust routing calls, the redundancy D quote routing. See that. Okay, so um, by policy space collapse, what do we mean? So if we just keep track of the set of waiting items in their classes without worrying about their position, that whole distribution um, will be the same for any position-based matching policy. So we are only considering policies like first come first match, second come first match, last come first match, et cetera, um, among the compatible items. And in particular, we're not permitting class-based policies. And I stole this term policy space collapse from this paper by Gopala Krishnan and Amy, I see is in the audience. Um, okay, so specifics on policy space collapse. Uh, so this is just throwing some notation at what I just said for um, the side and we'll see policy space collapse on a particular side of our possibly two-sided Q, uh, two-sided matching model. Um, we look at the number of uh, class I items in this vector and we Policy space collapse means that if we look at that under any two policies, they will have the same distribution at any particular time, T. Uh, so we only need to keep track of uh, the classes of the jobs and not their order. And um, th this will then imply the stationary distribution has the same policy space collapse when it exists. And, um, also the stationary mean waiting time because the distribution, we have the mean for the number in system, therefore by Little's law, we'll get the mean for the waiting time. And just a reminder that this does not mean the distribution of the waiting time doesn't matter. We all know the distribution will be more variable if you have last come first match than if you have say first come first match. Okay, so now let me summarize our results. So, and most of the time I'm gonna be talking about this first result the, that we get policy collapse for one side of uh, one or two sided matching models when we have exchangeability. And I'm gonna define that in a minute. Uh, the second result is for, uh, we have policy collapse, sta space collapse on both sides. If we have a two sided, I should have, change this to two-sided power of D uh, matching model. Uh, so, and we'll see power of D is a special case of exchangeable. 
Uh, the third result is we can have um, heterogeneous um, service times and still get policy space collapse for the idle servers in queuing models. And then our insensitivity result is for uh, one-sided matching models with feedback. Okay, so prior corollaries of our results um, are policy space collapse strictly for stationary distributions. And one is a recent paper by um, Anton and Gardner on the, this redundancy D, there's a policy space collapse. Uh, Aji and Ross had showed policy space collapse for assigning idle servers in a loss system when you had exchangeability. And um, this paper where I stole the, the term from showed uh, this policy space collapse for idle servers in a MMK queue, but where the servers have different speeds. And here it's just a, otherwise a plain vanilla MMK with full compatibility. And then the corollaries for insensitivity that have appeared are um, this Adon and Weiss paper um, for a loss queue. Um, we have insensitivity to service times. And then um, this paper on uh, drive times in ride sharing platforms full compatibility model, but um, we just have sort of losses on one side and you'll see what I mean in a minute. Okay, so now we're ready to launch into the details of this first um, result on uh, policy space collapse for exchangeable models. So only one side will be exchangeable. And so I'm gonna define it first for the B side being exchangeable. So we have a set of B side classes and for these models where we're assuming exchangeability on one side, we will also assume that the arrival rates of classes are the same for, for all the classes for that same side. So this, the beta i's is another assumption on top of the exchangeability. What do we mean by exchangeability? Well, the vector of ones and zeros, where you have a one, uh, if the um, A side uh, arrival is compatible with the B side class, that uh, vector for a random arrival uh, on the A side is exchangeable if it's permutation invariant. So basically the labeling of the servers makes no difference in terms of these compatibilities. That's what we mean by exchangeable. And um, we're all used to thinking about power of D. We can think of exchangeability as sort of a generalized power of D where uh, you first pick D could be random. So you pick it from a distribution to get a particular D. And then for the particular D, we have this power of D and otherwise, in, in other words, a side arrivals are compatible with D randomly chosen B side classes. So that means um, every class has degree D, every A side class in, and there are B choose D such classes for each of the little Ds. Okay, so that's exchangeability. Here's a picture. So this is now, again, it's B side exchangeable. It doesn't matter what order the B side servers are their server identities uh, don't matter because again, we're assuming, assuming they have the same rate and we have this exchangeability. And in this particular example, we have four uh, B side um, classes and the A side is, um, is exchange, uh, we have exchangeability among them where uh, an A side arrival is either compatible with any two servers or any four. And so we have a graph like this. This is sort of a power of two layered with a power of four uh, compatibility graph. And the B side exchangeability gives us common arrival rates on the A side for the ones with the same degree. So kind of by definition of this exchangeability of a random arrival having this matching property, we get common arrival rates. At least all the green ones have common arrival rate in this picture. 
And there are some more assumptions in addition to the betas all being the same, if we're talking about B side exchangeable, um, we also assume a common abandonment rate. If we have abandonments, um, exponential abandonments, a common rate for each side. And um, if there are finite buffers, it's either a common buffer or equal class-based buffer sizes. So it's we're imposing a lot of symmetry here on the problem. And once we impose all this symmetry, we that means the B-side classes are stochastically identical. There is no, they all look completely the same. The actual labels don't matter. Okay, here's an A-side exchangeable example, and it's just flipped. So uh, we have here, now there are four A-side classes and a B-side arrival. First we pick either D equals two or four, and then uh, randomly selected two, or in this case, all of the four uh, servers. And again, the common alpha now, because we're talking about A-side exchangeability, and this, all these other symmetry things on the um, uh, abandonment rate and the uh, buffer sizes. And then we get A side classes are stochastically identical. So again, it's not symmetric. Uh, so in this case, this class is not the same as these other classes. So we have all the A side classes here are stochastically identical, but not the B side. So the simplest examples are the M and the W. The M model is A side exchangeable if we assume alpha one equals alpha two. And the W model is B side exchangeable if we assume beta one equals beta two. And now once we've imposed all this symmetry, we get policy space collapse. So we have policy space collapse for the B side uh, when the B side is exchangeable. And so the service order doesn't matter on the B side because these are exchangeable. And the A side could either have a Q or not. The result holds regardless of whether the A side has a Q or not. If the A side is exchangeable, so we have a matching graph that looks like this, then we have policy space collapse on the A side. And B side could have a Q or possibly not. So now again, just kind of reminding us what we mean by this. That means for any policy, if we have X side where X could be A or B uh, exchangeability, then we have policy space collapse. It doesn't matter what policy we use to get the uh, this vector of counting the number of each of the different classes will be the same. And again, all that background stuff. And the proof is once you impose all this symmetry, it's a simple uh, proof. Now we need that symmetry. We don't have policy space collapse in general. Here's the simplest sort of asymmetric model is the N model and um, the response times uh, under these parameters for last come first match and first come first match for class one are quite far apart and similarly for class two. So. Okay, so corollaries of this first result of policy space collapse uh, in the exchangeable uh, case is now, now we're actually moving to what we think of as, as particular cues. And the first one we're gonna think about is the one where the servers can collaborate on jobs. So this means we have policy space collapse for the job queue with job side exchangeability Lambdas, now we're thinking of jobs arriving, so instead of alphas, well, we have lambdas, and exponential servers that can collaborate, um, summing the rates on the jobs. And why is this true? Well, because the collaborative service model is a one-sided matching queue. And why is that? So now we have jobs are queued, say, on the A side, uh, we have a fixed set of exponential servers, which sort of are the same as classes and no B-side queue. 
So each server in the background is generating a Poisson process. That's what this exponential service process is doing. It's just generating a Poisson process of potential service completions. And um, <clears throat> servers can collaborate on a job with the sum of the rates. That means we have uh, the, both Poisson processes, for example, could come here. Uh, when a server arrives, an arrival of one of those Poisson process events from the B side will result in a service completion if there's a waiting compatible job and it's assigned to that particular class or it's matched to that class of server or that server. And the servers, there's no queue on the server side on the B side. So the server service arrival is lost. The completion has no effect. It's a dummy completion if there's no compatible waiting jobs. So for this example, uh, <clears throat> there's one class one job sitting here and it can be matched with either server one or server two. So it waits for either one of those two Poisson processes uh, to arrive. And so it's gonna get served at rate mu one plus mu two, which is, uh, corresponds to beta one plus beta two. And servers three and four, they could arrive at their own rates, mu three and mu four, but they're lost. So, um, and this equivalence right now doesn't depend on the exchangeability or anything else. It's, it's just that the two are equivalent. Now we can apply what we've shown for the one side matching queue to say, okay, if we have job side exchangeability, so the simplest case is the M model, then <clears throat> if we have this collaborative server um, uh, mechanism, then we, uh, and this job side exchangeability, then we have policy space collapse on the job side. It doesn't matter whether you do first come first serve or last come first serve among the jobs or any other come first serve uh, thing, any other position-based uh, uh, rule. Okay, and uh, the collaborative, we can also think of as the cancel on complete redundancy where the jobs can run on multiple servers at the same time. It's the same as kind of waiting for multiple, uh, for uh, either of the um, Poisson completions at the same time. And once any copy completes, if it's running on a server, all the other copies are canceled. And so, you know, it's the minimum of the exponentials just as the sum of the rates. And therefore we get the same corollary for this cancel on complete where uh, say, you know, these could be running on the same server at the same time. And it says here, the server two, it doesn't matter. It can serve in any order, basically, because there's not much difference between class one and class two uh, from the job side. Okay, what about non-collaborative queues? A job can only be in service on one server um, and not, multiple servers at the same time. So this is what we usually mean by a multi-server queue. And now we're adding on the job server compatibilities. Well, this is really just a two-sided matching queue. So the A side has the jobs in the queue and the B side has the idle servers, the servers waiting for jobs. And I emphasize here the Q part. These now are jo uh, jobs that are receiving no service. They're waiting to be served. And a busy server, uh, say this, this one over here, um, if the busy server produces a Poisson event, it finishes service, it will pull the compatible job out of the queue the job queue and they'll go off and they'll be busy. On the B side, we have a single buffer space for each idle server. So that's the key to make it look like a plain vanilla queue, two-sided is to have a single buffer space for each server 
And it could have, if it has a server in it, that means the server's idle. And if that buffer space reserved for that server is empty, then, um, then that means the server is busy. Uh, and arrivals, when the server is full, I sorry, when the buffer is full, that means the server is idle, are lost. And other servers are busy uh, with jobs not in the job queue. So to, this particular view requires that we don't think about the busy servers and the busy jobs. They are not in the state at all. We can deduce which servers are busy and we don't care what jobs they're on because the rate only depends on the server, but we can deduce which ones are busy if we know which ones are idle, but those are not in our, our view. Okay, so now what does this, the, this mean for policy space collapse? Well, <clears throat> if we have exchangeability on the A side, so now that's the job side, so the M model, and we have uh, one buffer space for each idle server on the other side. Then we have that um, the policy space collapse basically for serving jobs for any, any arrival time order based policy works for assigning jobs. And that will have the same effect on the set. Now the N is counting the number of waiting jobs in the queue. Or we could have server-side exchangeability, that would be the W model. And now we're not saying anything about how you should serve the jobs, but we are saying that it doesn't matter how you serve the servers, which means assign the idle servers to jobs. So the order of assigning idle servers doesn't matter for the B side. And so that's just repeating what I just said. And just as an aside, this non-collaborative model, you can get by um, having a more distributed model of cancel on start redundancy. You send <clears throat> copies of the job to multiple servers and whichever one, once one starts, that means it's gone and it's going and being busy with that um, server and you cancel the other copies. And um, then we get the same corollaries if we have job side exchangeability, it doesn't matter what order we um, serve the jobs. And if we have server side exchangeability, it doesn't matter what order we um, serve the servers. Okay, so let me pause a minute to just see if there's any questions. Okay, then. Let's go to the second result, uh, which is on both sides of the power of D matching model. So it turns out in a way, this is a special case. So now we have uh, just a plain vanilla power of D. So this is power of D viewing it from the A side, which creates exchangeability on the B side. So the B side is gonna be exchangeable, but the A side is also gonna be stochastically identical, that um, the labels on the A side will not matter. So we get ident stochastically identical classes on both sides. And now <clears throat> the power of D, how you define it could be from either side. So either a fixed set of classes on the A side, power of D uh, uh, compatibilities with those classes from the B side or vice versa. <clears throat> And if we assume, uh, and again, we really just need to assume common rates on one side and because of the power of D, we'll end up with common rates on the other side. Um, we get policy space collapse for these power of D queues on both sides. So in this collaborative model, there is only one side and we get policy space collapse. So that's just a special case of the exchangeability one. Um, if we have a non-collaborative model, we have the two sides and now it doesn't matter how we get collapse on both sides. It doesn't matter how you serve the jobs. It doesn't matter how you assign the idle servers. And we could also think of like a combination make to stock, make to order system where the customers wait if there's not something in stock 
uh, you know, the hamburger's not made for them. And if, if the workers can get ahead and they might make some hamburgers or something in advance, so there's some make to stock, make to order, and it doesn't matter what order you assign the, uh, the customers or the inventory. Okay, so um, the third case is um, a, a little bit different. Um, and here it only makes sense for this, the case where we have a single buffer for every class on the on one side and let's say the B side. So a single buffer for every class of so this would correspond to the non-collaborative queuing model. <clears throat> so a single buffer for each class. Um, the, the other side may or may not have a queue. So we could have a loss model or not. And um, here now we allow the betas to be different. We can have different speeds for our servers, different uh, arrival, Poisson arrivals to these uh, single buffer uh, spots. And now, even with the different betas, we still get the service order on the B side doesn't matter in terms of the stationary distribution for the number of um, A side, uh, oh, sorry, the number of uh, B side idle queues of each class. So who's station, who's busy and who idle, who's idle in this case. Um, and before I talk about how that you prove that, um, just the corollaries, these were inspired uh, by a couple of papers here. Um, um, this one by Haji and Ross was, was for the loss system and exchangeable job server compatibilities. And then this um, other paper is for uh, a non-law system, but full comp compatibility. And to prove this now, this, this result is just for the stationary distribution, not for a fixed T. And we use the product form structure of the stationary distribution. So I am gonna sneak that in a little bit into this talk. Uh, this product form for matching models. And if we have a two-sided matching model, it's kind of a product of products, at least these uh, other terms. This one can't be decomposed, but here we have a product of terms for the classes. And <clears throat> um, this is now uh, assume first come first match for this product form that we will be relaxing it on the B side in a minute, but uh, under first come first match for the general two-sided model, this is the sta stationary distribution. And what, what do we do for every element in order uh, on the A side, we have the arrival rate for that class divided by the service rate for uh, the ith one, uh, the ith position, so the depart rate uh, for it and all the um, items ahead of it. So this total departure rate for the first I, A side items. And it's similar for the B side, the arrival rate for the B side item divided by the total departure rate for the positions up to whichever position we're looking at. And this has to be for admissible states. So if you've got A side items, and B side items, they can't be compatible with each other. They should have already left if they were. And here's <clears throat> just a, a specific example, just to make this a little more concrete. On the A side, you have this arrival rate for this first class divided by the total departure rate for that first class, which is compatible to, with these two. Uh, and then the arrival rate for the second one, total departure rate for that second one is class two. So, uh, sorry, the total departure rate for the first two. So either of the first two could leave if any of these three uh, beta side, B side um, items arrive. And then um, on the B side, we have this one idle server or one B side item and its arrival rate is beta four and it's 
departure rate is alpha four. Okay, <clears throat> so now if, so that was all just general product form. If we add in exchangeability on the B side, so for this fixed B side server set with the one buffer space per server, then <clears throat> the um, rate of match is compatible with the first J server, so these denominators, depend only on J, not on the server identities. And so we get this, it's some common gamma J for all the servers. And that means the stationary distribution doesn't depend on the order or the position of the idle servers. The stationary distribution doesn't matter what order they um, came in, and then we can use that. Uh, so that's for the first come first matching, but we can use that with, a little bit of argument to show that any position-based policy for assigning idle servers, even though they're different speeds um, <clears throat> to compatible jobs has the same stationary distribution. Um, the stationary distribution that we get here does depend on the set, implicitly on the set of set of idle servers, not the order, but the set, because it's gonna affect these um, uh, departure rates for the other side. <clears throat> okay, so that's the third um, result. Now, what the insensitivity, and this is actually a um, pretty simple uh, result. So <clears throat> we're going to think about a ride sharing model. So this is um, a, a kind of a one sided matching model hooked up with an infinite server queue. So the drivers arrive with different, and there's different uh, classes of drivers depending on how far they're willing to travel or whatever um, <clears throat> on the arriving on the A side. Uh, and we're assuming first come first match for this result. And we're assuming that it's the loss system on the other side. So the riders will not stick around if they don't find a driver, they're gonna to move to some other platform or go get a cab or something. So um, it's a one-sided match, there's no buffer over here. And we have this infinite server queue over here and um, we can show insensitivity because uh, from this theorem, so Krasinski, he's the one who first showed um, this uh, product form for order independent uh, queues and the matching models are a special case of those order independent queues. And also he and his students showed that, um, that it's quasi reversible, the one-sided matching model is quasi reversible. So we can put it in a Kelly network and the infinite server queue we know is insensitive and therefore the steady state performance of the ride sharing model is insensitive to the drive time distributions. And we also, by the way, get a nice product form for the stationary distribution, even with compatibilities. So again, we've got this, stick it in a network. This one by itself is quasi-reversible. This is a quasi-reversible view. Now we've got this Whittle network. We can have these arrivals. Oh, and I forgot to mention, they can go be busy, or they could come back, or they could uh, leave after being busy. And their day is over and then go away. And we could have multiple regions. And um, now we have as consequences um, this result by uh, Evo and Gideon. Hi, Gideon. Um, for the loss model. Um, so, uh, um, <clears throat> so a fixed set of drivers just going back and forth, busy, idle, without new drivers coming in. And um, also this result, the drive times don't matter when there's no compatibilities. Um, so. Okay, so let me wrap up. So once we impose symmetry in the compatibilities and the arrival rates, then order of service doesn't matter. That's the first couple of results. Um, <clears throat> if we have the symmetry and compatibilities, then order of assigning idle servers doesn't matter, even with heterogeneous service rates. 
if we have a one-sided first come first match matching model, um, it's quasi reversible. So we can stick it in this Kelly network to get insensitivity. And I guess the bottom line is my kind of ulterior motive here, here is to uh, emphasize the power of view of uh, thinking about these classical cues with compatibilities as one or two sided matching models. And then we can leverage um, the quasi reversibility, say, or the product form or um, <clears throat> just, yeah. Okay, questions? <laughs> 